So today we will move on to the time-dependent variety of density functional theory. And before I start developing the density functional theory, I will uh, first give you an overview of what kind of phenomena, what kind of things we actually want to describe. As you have learned, standard DFD, the Hornberg Cohn theorem in particular, refers to the ground state of matter. So that's the goal. We want to calculate the ground state properties, in particular the ground state energy and the ground state density. And TDDFD gives you a way to go beyond this limitation. So, what do we want to describe? So, a typical thing that we would like to describe is so called the driven system. That is systems that are exposed to some kind of time dependent external field. So the fundamental equation is then the time dependent, main time equation, time dependent, everywhere functional, and we have a time dependent kind of function. And as external terms, we typically have the interaction with the nuclei. So this would be the bare Coulomb interaction of the electron with coordinate Rj and the nucleus is coordinating our alpha. So those are all vectors. Um, and then there's the driving field. In the simplest case, the laser and dipole approximation. So this will be, again, the coordinate vector of the electron number J dot Envelope function E of T times um, cosine of omega T. So typically such a laser pulse will, will look like this. Right. And so this envelope here that is this function E of T. And so it's, if you wish, a time-dependent amplitude, and uh, the direction is somewhere in space. I won't talk about that. So that's our Hamiltonian. That's uh, the kind of thing um, we have to deal with. And just take a step back and think about what happens if you irradiate, let's say, a molecule or a solid with a laser. Well, after a while there's particles coming out, right? Electrons <coughs> come out, that's ionization. Photons may come out. And also nuclei, so that's dissociation. Right? So that's the kind of processes we we ultimately want to describe. <coughs> Spectrum. For example, we want to calculate the uh, probabilities of an electron uh, leaving the system with a given energy or with a given momentum. 
So this is one typical case. Another um, case that is also a driven system but slightly different is uh, uh, often identified with the word molecular electronics. So there we have a molecule and this is coupled to metallic leads that ultimately become far away, become microscopic, real wires. And there are some atomic tips here. It's not very well drawn. And um, so there's a, a molecule sandwiched between um, these leads. And then you also drive the system, but not with an electric field usually, but you turn on a bias, right? You connect this system at the end, far away from the molecule to a battery, and then you apply a voltage. And then as a consequence of the voltage, there will be some current going through. And usually after a while, there is a steady state Forming. In other words, there's a current flowing, which does not change anymore in time. So this is called a steady state. It's not a ground state, keep this in mind. So it's not the realm of ground state DFT, but it's a situation, it's a non-equilibrium situation that does not change in time. So that's a steady state. So here the goal would be <coughs> evolution to the steady state current. Okay, then a different kind of processes that uh, also one would like to be able to describe, but which so far um, has not progressed much, I would say. That's a description of um, relaxation processes. So this is something we typically find in extended systems. So again, you imagine you, you hit the system with some strong force. This may be a very short laser pulse. You can also mechanically hit it with a very fast hammer and whatever. And uh, then you want to see, you want to describe how the system relaxes back to equilibrium. So this is this kind of process. So a bit of different nature. Okay, so this um, gives you an idea. Um, in all these cases, we have an interacting system of many electrons and there's some external potential. Let's call this the external, which has a static part like a nuclear Coulomb interaction and some driving force. One thing that you should keep in mind, although this is pretty general and obviously really hard to do, um, this is already in several respects an approximation. First of all, um, you need to realize that there's no kinetic energy of the nuclei here. Right? 
coordinates. So the nuclei, those are the nuclei coordinates, are either fixed or one could imagine one treats the nuclear motion classically, so there would be some Newton equation, and this would be logical as a different color here. So some nuclear trajectory, let's say. Um, but that's an approximation. In reality, nuclei are also quantum particles. And in principle, one would have to deal with a full system of electrons and nuclei. This is not, both in ground state DFT and in TD DFT, this is not what one usually does. That's to be kept in mind. So, the hornback cone theorem, deep embodied in the hornback cone theorem, is, is the born Oppenheimer approximation. So, right? you fix the nuclei. And for this given potential of fixed nuclei, you look at the corresponding ground state density. And likewise here, right? either classically moving nuclei or fixed nuclei, and uh, you look at the dynamics of the electrons. And that's the primary goal of TDDFT. Another uh, aspect is not included in this kind of Hamilton, um, and uh, that's the quantized electromagnetic field. In reality, as you know, um, photons are also quantum particles, and uh, in principle we would have to describe the collisions of photons with electrons. That's the realm of quantum electrodynamics. This is also not what we are doing here. The interaction of the electrons with the photons is done with a classical field. Classical field, not um, single photons. Okay, but this problem by itself is already pretty hard. It's an uh, interacting many body problem, and therefore we would like to densely functionalize it. And uh, as in ground state DFT, we have dealt with the ground state density. Here in this case, we uh, we'll focus on the tiny family density. Yes? What would, what would, would it look like, the expression, if you wanted to have the, the, the laser for the quantum expression? So there you cannot write it down in first quantization. You have to invoke uh, creation and annihilation operators for the photons and they interact with the uh, quantized electrons, so you also rewrite the electrons in second quantization, which is just a way of writing. It's not something different physically, but for the photons it is different. And then you have the interacting quantum fields. So you can write down the ground field. That's what you do in quantum electrodynamics. So the time dependent density and RMT is normalized to the number of particles, like in the ground state case. And if one has the uh, many electron wave function, then the density is calculated by integrating. absolute square of the wave function and by integrating out all the coordinates but one. Alright, so with this object, the time dependent density, we then want to density functionalize our problem and um, one can proof um, a one-to-one -one correspondence similar to the home by cone theorem between the time dependent density and the external potential. So that is that's the first statement. One-to-one -one 
correspondence. between the time dependent external potential. So once again, external is all the one body interactions that act on the electrons. Not the two body interactions, all the one body interactions. So typically this includes the static part and the time dependent part. And there's a one to one correspondence to the time dependent density. The isn't, uh, does not depend on What does not depend Oh, yes, it does. Sorry. I forgot. Yes, absolutely. Does the R contain the spin program? I ignore spin for the moment. I will have a whole lecture on spin later on in this week under the heading of magnetism. So for here, I, for the time being, I, I ignore spin. But in principle, there's a sum. We could call this x2 until xn and x without index and you sum over all the spins then you could get the voting expression as. Uh, in each uh, question, it is mentioned in the first question, it is two body um, It's external to the electrons. It's a very good question. It is a two body interaction. It's an interaction between nuclei and electrons. That's right. But it's with respect to electrons, not a two-body interaction. So for, for the, from the point of view of the electrons, the nuclei are external. external. OK. So this is what we want to prove, ultimately. So like in the ground state, the idea is that given a density, and corresponding one body potential is unique. <coughs> and I will give you an indication of how the proof goes in a minute. So this is the analog, one could say, of the home by home theorem. And then the analog of the home champ equations. And it look like this, I divide T by J of R T. It's minus grad square over 2 plus a single particle potential ES of R and T, which we call a time dependent constant potential by sub J. Now, what is this time dependent concern potential? It consists similar to the ground state of three terms. First of all, the external potential of the system that we want to treat. So typically, we look at the Kuhn potential and the driving force. <laughs> then there is a time-dependent heart return. Time-dependent exchange correlation potential, which is a function L of the density. And it is, like in the ground state case, a multiplicative potential in the Schrödinger equation, but it depends on time. Yeah. So this functional dependence of the exchange correlation potential that has to be 
approximated contractance. So you see, the, the spirit of these theorems is very much like ground state DFT. Right? We have one-to-one -one correspondence, we have single particle equations, and the crucial feature of these equations is that that's the Colchamp theorem. Um, the density of the interacting system that we want to describe can be calculated as density of these non-interacting given by the sum over the absolute value squared of the time dependent core time of this. So that's the time dependent core time. <coughs> Now, there are some differences to ground state DFT, which I want to mention. So, as I said before, the spirit is very similar to ground state DFT, one-to-one -one correspondence in the Kuhn-Jamp system. But there are differences, and there's a question first. Yes? Yeah. So, uh, it's only a non-interacting system, so the density will gain by the same number of Yes. Would be a non-interacting system. But is it the same because we take the same density of the interacting system and we start with the function equations? Yeah, so it's the same, I would, yeah. The, this system of non-interacting particles is constructed in such a way that the orbitals, which are the solutions of these equations, give the true density of the interacting system. So that's, that's the gist of it. And this theorem tells you that this potential is unique. If you are given the density of the interacting system, there's only one. There's at most one potential that gives you. Then there's this V representability question. I will come back to that later. Um, the question whether it actually does exist. Okay, so first of all, we have seen yesterday that in ground state DFT you have a self consistency loop. You solve the, the ground state quantum equation self consistency. Self consistent. There's no such thing here. So we only have a nonlinear propagation in time. We propagate these equations in time. Now, this potential, Vxc, is, as I said before, a multiplicative operator in the Schrodinger equation. So it's simpler, in a sense, as uh, than uh, time dependent Hatch 4. But the functional dependence on the density is, and I want to indicate it in this way, is non-local with respect to space and with respect to time. So, 
This might sound a bit scary, but it's not. I mean, it's not local, but so what, right? It's nothing special. Look at the half meter. It's also non-local dependence on the density. Non-local means that the potential at point R, right, that's R, potential at point R, depends on the densities at all other points are prime. That's what is called a non-local dependence, right? Nothing special. But in TDDFG we have the same thing with respect to time. So the potential at time t depends on the densities at all other times t prime. In fact, on all previous times t prime. Otherwise we would violate causality. Okay. Now let me give you um, an indication of the proof. Proof would take maybe an hour or so to show it to you in full beauty. Um, that's why I just give an indication of how this is done. Right, so the idea is we have a set of potentials, V of R and T, potentials, and we imagine for each of those potentials we solve the time dependent running equation. Means for each of those potentials we will get time dependent many body wave functions solving time dependent shredding equations. But here you realize another difference from ground state DFT, namely the time dependent shredding equation is an initial value problem. So you have to prescribe an initial state and from that on the propagate. So what this means here, we solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation, I T psi is H of T psi with a fixed initial many body state psi that's time t naught, let's say, is a given function psi naught of R1 for R2. So, let me say again what this means. We fix the initial state, and then for this fixed given initial state, we propagate the time dependent Schrödinger equation with different potentials, right? Let's say another one, the external prime, and we get the wave function psi prime. But always with a fixed initial state. So from the fixed initial state, we propagate with different potentials. For each potential, we then get time dependent wave function, and then for those wave functions, for each of those wave functions, we calculate the time dependent densities, n of r and t, let's say prime of r and t, and um, we have to prove Demonstrate this one to one correspondence 
that this case where we have two potentials, V of R and T, will be prime of R and T. It leads to the same density. I have to prove that this cannot happen. Right? Because if this would happen, we could not go back uniquely from a given density to a potential. And if there were two different potentials that give the same time propagated density, we could not go back uniquely. So we have to prove that this cannot happen. So, slightly more mathematically, it means that if two potentials are different, at this point I have to specify slightly more clearly what it means to be different. Remember, in the ground state version of DFT, we had this non-uniqueness with respect to the constant, right? You have potential V of R, and you add some constant to it. For whatever constant you add, the corresponding ground state density is the same. So it's only this class of potentials that differ by constant that are in one-to-one -one correspondence to the density. And a similar thing here, we also have a constant, but this constant may be time-dependent. So I call it time-dependent constant where the word constant refers to the R dependence, right? So it's not depending on R, but on the other. So if two potentials differ by more than just the time dependent constant, then this is what we have to show. Um, the densities are different. So, now remember, how do we do this in the ground state case? Well, we use the variation of Benzema, the von Mekong theorem and the David Lieb uh, construction, the constraint search formulation of DFT. They use the variation of Benzema. In the time-dependent case, we cannot do that. The reason is that we do not have, in the time-dependent case, a principle by which the solution minimizes the function. We have a variation principle, but it's not a minimum principle. It is typical for time-dependent problems, Lagrangians, also in classical mechanics, you minimize for the ground state. That's the Ray Levitz principle. But in the time-dependent case, you only make some action functional or Lagrangian stationary but you don't minimize. That's a huge difference. So it means in particular that we cannot use the variational principle to prove um, the one-to-one -one correspondence. That was the question? Sorry? Is it just time-dependent? No, it's not space-dependent. That's important. Yeah, that's, that's why I called it time-dependent constant. The word constant refers to the R dependence. So it does not depend on R. But only on Okay, so how is this done? Well, so we start, as I said before, from a fixed initial state. And then we propagate under the influence of two different potentials, V of R and T and V prime of R and T. And in the first step, we look at the current densities, J of R and T, that result from propagating with these two different potentials. Um, so this is step one of the proof. So we show that for two different potentials, 
different meaning, more different than the time dependent case. The corresponding current densities are the same. And then in the second step, we prove that the resulting densities are different. So for the first step, we use the equation of motion, the Heisenberg equation of motion for the current density. So that's produce I dt J of R T is given by the expectation value with respect to the many body wave function of the current density operator in the time dependent tabletonium. So that's so that's the proof. For the first step, we use this equation of motion. And for the second step, we use the continuity. To show that these densities that originate from two different potentials are different. And we look to show that they are different, we look at the initial time. So here I plot the density. Yes, time. Here at T0, the whole process starts. And the densities and everything else, initially, whatever we calculate uh, for the case V and V prime, are identical because we start from a fixed initial state. So in particular, the two densities at the initial time are the same. But then, as we look at later times, infinitesimal later, we see that the densities kind of diverge, they run away from each other. And if they run away from each other, it means they're different. That's the whole problem. And we show this by expanding the two potentials, V and V prime, around the initial time to naught with respect to time in the Taylor series. And you show that Taylor coefficients then of the densities are different. Yes? Uh, I have a question regarding the current density. Mm -hmm. The J uh, usually means a velocity or something involved in the J. Um, or I don't know the uh, velocity if I'm not wrong, the Trudeau model. Is that correct? Uh, there's or? also a velocity involved. If you want to look at that, you, you could. Mm -hmm. But the current density itself is, is also a physical observable. <coughs> Right? You, you get it from the wave function by psi star gradient psi minus psi gradient psi star. And that's the way to calculate it. Right? And if one divides this by the density, the time dependent density, one gets a, a time dependent velocity field. Okay. Yeah, so you, you're absolutely right. Velocity also involves something like uh, a current density also involves something like velocity. And it's clear that this happens, right? Because we drive the system, right? Driving with some external field means the electrons move, so they have a velocity. But then here they neglect the or the solution with the other No, no. Because we propagate the full Schrödinger equation. Uh, this is what I indicated here. This is the full Schrödinger equation without hammer coupling. And here's the electron electron interaction, so the collisions are there. Okay, so in the original proof by Eric Homer and myself, the domain 
on which the one-to-one -one correspondence can be shown. The domain of allowed potentials is the set of potentials that are identical with their Taylor expansion with respect to time. So domain so this is functions of our team that are but to the time. Okay, so this is a, if you wish, a smoothness condition. We want kind of smooth potentials. Yes? Uh, specifically between how you say that the potential are different, but uh, what about the density? When you say the density would be different. So, by different, I mean what is exactly indicated here. So, we start from a fixed initial state and propagate under the influence of two different potentials. And I look then at the density that is produced by the potential V, and I look at the density that is produced by the potential V prime. And it turns out the time evolution of the two densities is different. So they run away from each other in the vicinity of the initial time t naught. And that's all to prove that they are different. And they may come back close to each other later, we don't care. But if they are initially different, they are different. That's all. Okay, so <clears throat> so we, we need to be able to expand the potentials in the Taylor series sum over M um, over M factorial D V over R S T at times naught times t minus t naught of n. So this is the Taylor expansion of one of those potentials. These coefficients should exist, and they, uh, the radius of convergence should be finite. This is what it means that the function is identical to, this, to its Taylor expansion. So there should not be holes or discontinuities or things like that. So that's the, that's the domain. Now there has been a lot of activity of extending this domain. I want to first think what cases this uh, domain does not cover. And there are indeed some serious restrictions. And um, this is what I want to talk about now. So cases not covered by 
by the domain of Taylor expandable functions in, in the non gross theorem. So, I would say there are three important cases. Um, Adiabatically switched potentials. This is a very important concept in um, especially linear response theory, so Mipa may talk about this later. If you want to perturb a system with a monochromatic, so single frequency perturbation, try to do this with the formalism of linear response theory, you realize that everything is ill-defined. And the way to do it is to switch on this monochromatic perturbation idiomatically, uh, which means that you have an essential singularity in the time limits. So this is something like V of T is e to the minus alpha 1 over T squared, for example. So if you expand this, this is an essential singularity at t equals 0, or since we had t naught before, something like that. All the Taylor coefficients are 0, right? so clearly this is not covered. It's a mathematical idealization, you cannot produce this thing in nature, but it's important. It's important, this concept of monochromatic. Um, for the relations. Okay, another case is uh, this is still under discussion, but I put it here nuclear point charges. And um, so, point charges meaning divergent Coulomb potential. One uh, I cannot see that here in what I have showed before, but if one looks at <coughs> perturbations, one finds that if the potential has a nuclear point charge, then the density turns out to be non-analytical. So it's not directly related to this domain, but maybe a problem. Again, this is in a way a mathematical artifact. Nature doesn't have point charges. All Nuclei in nature are finite, but it's an important case. And then uh, another case is periodic solids, so extended but periodic systems. They are uh, also in ground state DFT, actually, the one by Korn theorem is not valid. Uh, that's something that we have not yet discussed yesterday, but I mentioned that here as well. In the time-dependent case, that's a problem too. So this is pretty much what I want to say. Um, I have to apologize um, that I have to dash off now for an appointment downtown in, in Lausanne. I'll be here for the rest of the week, so if you have questions, I'll, I'll always be available, except in the coming hour. So, <laughs> But um, Nipa and the other lecturers We'll be happy to answer your <laughs> questions. <laughs> so I'll be happy to answer the first question, and then, then I'll run off. One Okay, very good point. This will be the topic of my second lecture. Okay. So yeah. that will be answered. There, there I compare the, the many body approach with the 
EFT. That's exactly your question. Okay, see you later. <laughs>
for which for the two potentials this coefficient is different. And then you'll see that that at that order in the time derivative, the two currents begin to differ. Sure. Yeah. Um, just to make sure I understand. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you say the PRT mm -hmm. uh, is identical with the Taylor expansion with respect to time, yes. essentially you mean that it's Taylor expanded. Exactly, or time analytic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, as Hardy said, there are some exceptions to this. For example, this is a very smooth function, but it's not time analytic. If you look at all the Taylor coefficients of this at t equals t0, you get 0. But the function is a very smooth function. Maybe these are sometimes called bump functions in math. Could you treat that issue by changing the time reference? Yeah, that's a good, very good question. In fact, you could if so. You could if you knew the new initial state, what the what the state was at that different time, right? So because remember, one a crucial thing in all the proof in the proof here, I would say a crucial thing is this initial state dependence, right? In fact, the functionals, and I'll talk a bit more about this in the memory lecture later, but the functionals, the VXC, you really should have here. Um, an initial state dependence, and I'll talk about this later, because the mapping depends on the initial state, the one-to-one -one mapping, so the functional depends on the initial state. So anyway, yes, so back to your question, yeah, so if you had something funny going on at T0, you'd say, well, why can't we just do the whole proof of this some later time? You could, if you knew what the wave functions were at the, at the time. Yeah. So these uh, restrictions and problems with the theory uh, is it your opinion that the general practitioner can be aware of them? Yeah, no, not really. <laughs> uh, maybe for periodic solids, yeah. Um, this is, as, as Hardy said, it's a very rare case, right? It's not really physical. You never have something that turns on very slowly from the ability, right? It's an idealism. The nuclear point charge is also numerically, um, you know, you're on a grid, right? You remember, or on a basis set or something. So you never, in fact, re resolve the Coulomb singularity. Right. So, in fact, it's it's we're you know we're, these these are important sort of mathematical concerns, if you like. But as for the practical ramifications, it's not so important. The periodic solids, um, one might one um, might be one one should be a bit more aware because the point is that if you have kind of a macroscopic current going through the system, then you can show that the one to one mapping breaks down. So there, you have to use something like current as a function. Yeah. Um, the analytic and time requirements, does that need to be over all time or just over a region of interest that yeah, so the, the initial Yeah, no, so yeah, if there's a rate, so it has to exact the letter. Okay. So it has to have this has to have a non zero radius of convergence in time, um, including the initial time, yeah. Yeah, so for example, you can also extend this kind of proof to piecewise analytic potentials, like where it does this for a certain time, then it sort of changes its behavior, and the, which is also important because, like, you might want to have one laser field, you turn it off, and you can go, yeah. Um, you can have the coffee. Yeah, the coffee. <laughs> 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 yeah.